Welcome back to another episode of Taking Inventory. This week, we're welcomed by Patrick Harris, President of Americas at Snap, our former company. He joined Snap after 12 years at Meta, where he was the VP of Global Agency Development and the VP of Global Channels. And before that, he spent almost six years at Microsoft. So Patrick, we're excited to have you here. You, you've kind of been at the three horsemen of tech, the evolution of tech. So thank you for joining the podcast today. Uh, Daniel, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So James and Patrick, I know you guys have a, a long history. So why don't we kick off just hearing a little bit about that? Um, and then we can get into your origin story. Yeah, no, James, I, I think we met when you were uh, maybe at Shift, right? In the early days when Facebook was developing, I think what was called the FMP program at, at the time, the Facebook marketing partners program. And, uh, I, I think we also had, you know, this, this similar connection, which, uh, was a gentleman by the name of Peter Hirschberg, who was one of the co-founders and the CEOs at Reprise Media. Uh, and I worked with Peter both at Ask Jeeves as well as at Reprise Media. And I think he ended up being either a board member or like one of the advisors to you guys as you were, uh, launching ship. So I don't know, hopefully I'm not dating myself with these comments, but, uh, <laughs> James, I think that's where you and I first met. It is. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, uh, Peter was an investor and advisor. He was like part of a very big reason why we did not screw up that company. Um, <laughs> and he was, uh, incredibly helpful. And then, yeah, man, it was back when you guys were doing, it was like the John Yee days. I remember like going to like declinate and it was like the precursor to F8. So yeah, I feel like I'm, you know, I, I'm turning 40 this year and it's like, I've been working on this stuff now for way longer than I ever could imagine. Um, so, but, but the whole time you've been incredibly supportive and, um, and we appreciate all the help and, and also appreciate you coming on the pod. Um, so I think that's kind of a good place to get to. Like we, we want to absolutely know what's going on with everything with Snap. And like, we obviously follow it closely and, and we care about it immensely, but, you know, we kind of love to ask this question to everyone on the podcast, which is like, what is your origin story? Like you are now president of America's at Snapchat. It is like a very cool job, but like how, like what is the path to get here for anyone listening who wants to be you one day? Like what was, what was the road? Just kind of tell us how, how it all happened. I, I love this question. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share, you know, really come from humble beginnings. I mean, to, to really start at the origin, you know, I am a, I am a son of a fighter pilot turned entrepreneur but also the son of a, uh, a mother who was a special education teacher for more than 30 years in the California Unified School District. And so you can imagine the conversations at our dinner table, uh, especially as I was an only child, you know, having a, a military father turned entrepreneur and, and somebody else that was trying to save the world. And so I, I think a lot of my, my early childhood and even today, and even as how I think about approaching my career was, was definitely very shaped uh, by the points of view of my, of my parents who um, God bless are still with us today. And so I had the opportunity to go to, to, to college in Southern California, um, to a small private school called the university of San Diego, uh, go Toreros. And, you know, the origin story for career really started out, I guess, in around 1996, uh, I was a communications major there. I had an enhanced minor in business. I knew I couldn't be a business major because I hated the accounting classes. And so I just really fell in love with media communication studies there. And I had an assistant professor there named Dr. Hanser who had worked in, um, he worked in media in New York for a long time. And I'd taken like this really, really great public speaking class with him, um, studied a lot of media theory, whether it was Marshall McLuhan and others. But then one semester, I remember distinctly, it was in 1996, he was teaching this thing called an HTML class. And I thought this is really cool because a few years prior, when I arrived on campus, my freshman roommate was a guy by the name of Aaron Shanahan. He was from Seattle. He was there on a golf scholarship, but his dad worked at Microsoft. And I remember when I arrived in my freshman dorm room, there was sort of a PC sitting on a desk already. And it was hooked up to this email system called Pine, right? This was like 1994. And so like, this was sort of my first hands-on keyboard experience was like two years earlier with the early versions of email. And then back to this, you know, Dr. Hanser HTML class in 1996, um, I had the opportunity to build, you know, my first website uh, for my dad's small business. And at the time, this is when sort of like web crawler, Alta Vista, uh, lots of these new kind of search engines were evolving as the web was taking shape. And then people were trying to figure out, well, how do we organize the web's information? 
And so um, that was really the catalyst of like a lot of interest for me, James. And what I did as a result was I went and found an internship in New York City. Uh, and the only internship that I could find was that was remotely digital was at this company called uh, Turner Broadcasting uh, and Turner Interactive. And they had this small like 10 to 12 person team at the time that was led by a gentleman named Richie Glassberg. Now, Richie had been the head of cable news sales at Turner and at CNN for a long time. But a few years prior, they had launched this website called CNN.com. They said, we're going to put, you know, more news on the internet. And in fact, the summer I was there, they launched a website called CNNSI.com. That was a, a co-venture and a partnership with Sports Illustrated. So I was the intern there, like facts and IOs, watching 468 by 60 and 120 by 600, you know, banners get put on a website. And I remember him saying to me, hey, kid, we're going to sell ads on the internet and this is going to be great. And um, that was the only internship available because every other internship at Turner Broadcasting that summer change was, was literally just about working in cable news, right? Or working in the ads division. And so um, fast forward, went back to San Diego for a year and then came straight back to New York almost six days after I graduated from college. And uh, I took a job at a little company called the Technology Education Network. It was my first job in New York City. It was in a building at 55 Broad Street in New York, across the street from the uh, New York Stock Exchange. It was the only building in New York City at the time that had a T1 connection. Imagine broadcast.com, but for B2B. Like, that's what this thing was. Um, it was really cool. I spent uh, a few months there and then uh, had the opportunity to go back. And, like, I really wanted to get back on the ad side of things because I loved my experience at Turner. And so... Um, you know, spent some time with a, at a company called Prize Point that uh, eventually turned into Uproar that was eventually bought by Vivendi that happened to be started by a guy named Chris Hassett, who was like, you know, the developer of, of Pointcast, which was, um, I think, one of the first like RSS technologies in the 90s. And so I got my, my feet wet there in ad sales at this, you know, small gaming company that turned into Uproar. Uh, and then uh, eventually went to, uh, you know, a, a little search engine called Ask Jeeves. Um, and spent four years at Ask, and then uh, saw this gap in the market between sort of the way that search was being purchased and the way that Madison Avenue was, uh, was, was really interacting, you know, with the ecosystem. And uh, two friends of mine that were uh, with me at Ask Jeeves, these two childhood best friends, Josh Dahm and Peter Hirschberg said, hey, we're going to start this company, Reprise Media. It's going to be like this ad agency or intermediary between sort of Overture and AdWords and a lot of the early search monetization platforms. And so spent a number of years there, then had the opportunity, never worked at a big company, had the opportunity to go to Microsoft um, because Microsoft at this time said, hey, we want to go, you know, chase Google and chase Yahoo for search dollars. And so they had this thing called MSN search that then became live search that eventually became Bing. And while I was there um, for years, I'd worked with like some really great people namely a guy named Dave Jakubowski, who you might know, or Brian Boland. And these guys were like the early product marketing leaders on monetization for search at Microsoft. Uh, and Brian in particular had left and moved down to Silicon Valley from Seattle to go work at, at a company called Facebook. And this was probably in 2008 or 2009. And then they called me in 2010 and said, hey, we're going to start building like some capabilities around you know, our partner ecosystem and how we develop relationships with agencies. And we think you'd be perfect for this. And I thought, you know, this is crazy. Like I'm a general manager, you know, moving up the, the, the food chain here at Microsoft, managing a large team. I was able to do a lot of different things there. And, uh, you know, I basically said yes after about 11 interviews to take an individual contributor job at Facebook, uh, making a lot less money than I was making at Microsoft. Because what I had seen in my career to that point was, you know, early evolve, uh, the early evolution of the web, the indexing and being able to search the web, this sort of shift in dynamics to what I thought was going to go from not just search, but also to social and then social to mobile. And so kind of really following some of those trends and uh, just trusting, trusting your gut and trusting that. You always want to follow great talent and great people and great ideas. Um, served me well. And I ended up spending 12 years at uh, what I still refer to as Facebook, but I think everyone today refers to it as Meta. And uh, that takes us to today. You know, I, I, joined, I joined Snap almost uh, a year ago and it's, uh, it's been great so far. Yeah, it's a pretty epic 
journey and you've like touched, as you said, like every, I feel like every major kind of platform shift, like you were kind of like at the, I mean, you were like on the ground floor of, um, and you know, I, I guess from, from your perspective, maybe just on the meta experience, you're like, how hard was it for you to leave after that long? And after like all the impact that you had made and just, you know, you know, just like any, everyone knows how big meta has gotten and anyone who worked with you knows what impact you had, especially I feel like over time on the agencies, it was like, Patrick, you were like the face of the relationship and it's a lot of ways between like how meta worked with some of like the biggest advertisers in the world. So what was the process for you to be like, okay, like this place is killing it. It's not, you know, it's still super dynamic, like, but you know, I got to go to snap. What was, you know, yeah. How, how'd you approach that? I think there were a few things. I mean, I think the pandemic was, it was a big reset moment for a lot of people and a lot of companies. And, you know, I, had, I had spent James the better part of a decade at that point, um, you know, spending two to 300,000 miles a year on the road, um, which was exhilarating. And by the time I left, you know, I had teams and, um, a couple dozen countries, you know, a big revenue responsibility, a fairly large, complex and matrix org. And I loved it. Like I loved my time there from, you know, being a, an early IC to be able to grow into a director role to, 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 you know, beyond, be able to take on like responsibilities and, um, and be responsible and really leading people and advocating for people and advocating for partners. And it was like a responsibility, um, that, that I absolutely love and I was humbled by and I loved my time there, but I also looked around, you know, as we were starting to come back from the pandemic and I was really doing some hard reflection. And, and in fact, a lot of it had to do with sort of like, even thinking about the evolution of a human. Now stick with me for a second. When I started and I joined Facebook in 2011, right? Um, my oldest daughter was in kindergarten. Um, that same daughter is about to graduate from high school this year, uh, in a couple of weeks from now. And I thought, you know, gosh, what happens to a human over the course of almost 12 years, right? When you start your educational journey in kindergarten, and then you're about to graduate from high school. And so I'd spent the same amount of time, obviously a different point of maturity in my life versus my now 18 year old daughters. But I thought to myself, I've built a really incredible team. I've I've been able to work with some of the most, you know, impressive people um, that I continually had learned from over, you know, 12 years. And I felt really comfortable that it was time to pass the baton to some of my other leaders who I thought James could just do a much better job than I could to take it to the next level. And I also sort of had this like itch and bug in me to go back and maybe do something that was a little bit smaller, see if I could recreate similar type of impact. And um, when Evan called me uh, for the first time, you know, we really hit it off quickly. And um, I think our values, I think our point of view on like where technology was going, um, the safeguards, like the responsibility um, and, I think just like the underlying opportunity that Snap sort of presented, like it caught me at, at sort of the right time. And I thought to myself, like, what a unique opportunity to join a company that is about to go on a massive turnaround journey, right? With a CEO and co-founder who had the institutional kind of like fortitude and the willingness to like really dig deep into the details, really make a lot of the hard changes. And so the more I spent time with him and then the more I spent time with subsequent leaders at Snap, I was struck by the values of kind, smart, and creative. I was struck by the enormous amount of opportunity and how the company was sort of misunderstood. And then I looked and said, if you look at all sort of the, the different secular trends that are defining technology today around AR, around AI, around messaging, around the creator economy, short form video, I just thought, wow, and here's a platform that also has, you know, 800 million monthly active users. Um, there feels like a lot of untapped potential here. And yet there feels like there's also a strong willingness to change and to bring in some new capabilities and competencies of leaders, look at different operating models, look at different structures. 
And so I think when you sort of take those two things, right, like willing to pass the baton because you left the thing uh, that you've built for the last 12 years in a very good place and you can hand it off to very capable people that are going to do it better than you did and then be able to kind of reinvent yourself again, you know, at this stage of my career was um, incredibly like intoxicating and exciting. And so um, it made it made it easy to say yes. It just felt it felt like the right time. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think everyone, anyone who listens to podcasts knows that like, we just, we like still deeply care about Snap and believe in it. And I, I agree. Like I look at, you know, Evan has been right pretty much about like every major trend. It's like crazy that no one really like appreciates it, but it's like full screen video, AR, privacy, brand safety, like every major thing that now is like the default position, Evan was years ahead of. And so, you know, for a period of time, I think, you know, obviously like Snap had its sort of public sort of questions around it, primarily tied to like the stock price. And I think a bunch of us who were alumni felt like we were taking crazy pills that great people like you weren't going there. And so I think now you can see there's like inertia behind it. And it's just very cool to see. Because again, like I don't know of, there's not another consumer application that is not TikTok slash ByteDance, which has like its own set of issues that has gotten to this scale, like in the last 20 years. It's just like, it's wild. Um, and so it's super exciting to see what you guys are doing. Obviously I'm biased, but um, it's very cool. So, uh, but uh, Daniel, I know, I know you had questions about maybe uh, what it's been like since he's got there. Yeah, I mean, as you were thinking about joining Snap, I mean, you, it sounds like you had a lot of conversations with Evan, uh, with other senior leaders. What did you know about Snap before you started those conversations? And, and what during those you know, during those meetings were you maybe surprised to learn or um, fell in the trap of like the public perception that, that James is talking about that maybe, you know, is, is a misconception versus reality? Sure. Yeah, Daniel, it's, it's funny. I mean, in one of my earliest conversations with Evan, I said, you know, I'm actually, I'm not a power user of the app. And um, thinking like, oh my gosh, is this, you know, is this not the smartest thing to say to the co-founder and CEO when you're talking about a potential job opportunity? He's like, no, I think that's great. He goes, you know, we're, a, we're sort of, we're one of these organizations where, you know, we really embrace like curiosity and learning. And I think having fresh perspectives and um, different alternative point of view around like what we could be doing better with the product and how we could be approaching advertisers. He just didn't see it as a liability. And as I continued to dig, and I continued to spend more time across, you know, the product leaders, um, some of the sales leaders, other partnership leaders, um, but then really like diving deep, Daniel, into like, again, who is this audience? Who is the consumer? I had a lot of misperceptions that the platform was like just for teenagers, because again, I've got two teenagers at home and they were always begging for Snap. And we always said, hey, you can pick one and like you get to pick your one thing and then that's it. And so... Like one of my daughters had Snap and one of them had Instagram. Now they obviously both have Snap. And like, I now communicate with my daughters more on Snap than anything else. It's like, I can text them and I don't get anything back. If I snap them, I'm getting responses very, very quickly. And so it was interesting because I knew how big it was with the Gen Z community. And like, if you look at 13 to 24 year olds, as an example, I think we've got like 90% penetration in almost 25 countries around the world. If you look at, 13 to 34, even go up 10 years, it's like 75% penetration in those same, you know, 25 countries around the world. But what I didn't know, Daniel, what like surprised me so much was that the audience was also sticky and growing up and Snap turned 13 this year, right? And what's so crazy is like that 13 year old that joined 13 years ago is now 26, right? That 17 year old that was in high school that joined 13 years ago is now 30. So that person might be like, you know, buying their first home, they might be buying a car, they might be starting a family. And so I think what was most surprising to me in the US was like, oh my gosh, like over 50% of the audience now is over the age of 25 and one in four Snapchatters is actually over the age of 35. And when you think about the opportunity that unlocks in certain categories that might have historically said, you know, Snap's not the platform for us, thank pharmaceuticals, think financial services, think automotive, think certain portions of like, you know, traditional consumer packaged goods. I just thought like, wow, this is, this is an incredible opportunity. And then I think the other thing that 
that again, I sort of, I just, um, I didn't anticipate as much as is like the happiness factor of the app. And I know, you know, some t- my daughters and I joke, we we're always like, Snap feels always like the happiest place on my phone, right? Because it opens the camera, because you go to chat and then you go look at the creators and then you go look at stories, content. Like there are so many different modes that you can be on, see where your friends are on the map. But like, it just sort of felt like the antithesis of traditional social media, which again is ironic given our positioning and the way that we've gone to market this year with our marketing message around less social media, more Snapchat. And that was meant to be sort of like, you know, a sharp elbow kind of point of view to allow us to open the conversation to have with marketers and with stakeholders and with partners around how not to just like lump us in with everybody else. Because I do think the platform was built, you know, as a default with delete. And James, to your point around being ahead of the curve on brand safety, on community standards, on privacy on all of these things, we're certainly far from perfect, but I think we get it better than a a lot of other folks. And that was just another sort of like unique kernel and attraction, which was, hey, like this is a place where, again, I think you can look at the connections that people have online, but then also translate them into the real world and say like, how are these platforms actually bringing friends and family and the people closest to you closer together? And you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, Pollyanna about this or anything, or I don't want to say that, like, you know, I'm an idealist on this stuff, but it does feel like the place where there's less activity around, like, doom scrolling. Like, we're all guilty of it. Like, sometimes I'm laying in bed and I'm like, you know, I'm on other apps and I'm like, oh, my God, it's been 25 minutes and I'm looking at a bunch of content from people that I don't know, stuff that I don't really care about. And then I'm like, do I feel better after I'm using this thing? And like a lot of times the answer is no. And I just thought like, again, Snap had something that just felt different, but yet misunderstood. And I liked that combination. It's awesome. It's funny you talk about the, the aging up things. I think it's another thing people don't, don't think about it. And we used to, you know, when we were there like 2016, you know, we would talk to advertisers and we'd be like, listen, it's a really young community so like the gdp of this community is relatively speaking low they just don't have a lot of earning power but i was like eventually they will these kids will grow up and we had all the stats about how sticky they were and it's cool now you look at that to your point eight years later the the gdp of the community of snapchatters is increasing dramatically every year right these kids are just making money now and they're growing up and they so it's i I think it's another thing that like you know finally the market i think is sort of starting to to get it and, you know, obviously I think, you know, your guys' last quarter, I think sort of proved to that because basically like, you know, if you, if the GDP is growing, that basically means you can deliver ideally more value to your advertisers, right? And that's kind of where direct response and performance can start to come into play. And so maybe that's a good transition to sort of, you know, I think a lot of people that we talk to day in, day out, you know, I think if you're like, if you're a Shopify seller or in the app space, you actually now start to think like Snap can work for me. Like I talk to people all the time that say that. But if you talk to maybe like some brand at the hold goes, they're like, this thing isn't a performance channel. And so can you kind of talk about like how that transition's going, how things have changed and what you're seeing there? Yeah, ha- happy to. And I think I read a stat recently that was something like Gen Z has north of like $2 trillion of spending power. Um, we can probably validate this after the pod, but like, again, to your point, James, it's, it's, um, it's an audience that like, can't, shouldn't be um, misinterpreted for its opportunity. And I think, you know, one of, one of the other reasons I decided to join was, was again around this opportunity for performance advertising. I, you know, I'd spent the better part of my career in search and in social where um, performance was everything, right? And um, there was a real willingness and commitment, you know, at Evan's level along with hiring um, some really accomplished people, whether it was from Amazon or from Google or from Meta, or even just like continuing to invest in some of the homegrown talent that really understood performance in DR, especially in sort of like the post ATT era, right? And and looking at smart ways that we could continue to like, you know, build a real muscle and capability around performance advertising. 
And so for the better part of the last two years, there's been an incredible amount of investment to like rebuild, reconstitute the ad platform, um, really making sure that we're investing in like, you know, the right machine learning, um, the right sort of like infrastructure and stack that will help like drive better results and performance for, for advertisers. And so when I look at the things that we've done around, you know, um, like our seven zero pixel purchase, um, opportunity or the work that we've done over the last year around our conversions API product, some of the work that we've done with measurement partners, including MTAs, um, you know, it's all about making sure that like snap is just not a place where people go for upper funnel or mid funnel or kind of like digital stunt campaigns, but we are truly in the business of driving other businesses. Um, and that part again, I think is just like such a rich, huge opportunity for us to continue to pursue because there's not a single client I've talked to in the last year that I've been in the company that says, we want to spend more money next year with the duopoly. It's not a single one, right? And everybody is looking for diversification, but you also need to prove that you work, right? And so as we go on this, you know, DR performance journey, in addition to having great full funnel products for upper funnel advertisers and for mid funnel advertisers, being able to address like that full funnel opportunity, but also be able to hone in on parts of that funnel that we know are particularly important. Because if you're a commerce advertiser or retail advertiser or an apps ecosystem advertiser, like we know we need more performance products in the bottom of that funnel. And so um, it's been awesome because we're making progress. And I think you saw that show up and was probably reflected most accurately in, in some of the numbers that we shared in the Q1 performance. But it's been a multi-year journey and it's still early in that journey. But I give a lot of credit to, again, back to Evan and bringing in a product and monetization leader like Darshan Kantuk, right? Darshan was one of the pioneers at building the DPA product at Meta circa, I think, 2015 to 2018. He was then running Google Search, right? For him to come over, amazing. You know, a new head of engineering and Eric Young, um, you know, Ronan Harris, no relation to Patrick Harris, who runs our EMEA <laughs> business. He spent, I think, you know, uh, more than 12 years at Google um, and really understands performance. And then Ajit Mohan, who, uh, you know, was one of my colleagues at Meta, had been running India there and is now running APAC for, for Snap. If you think about, again, the characteristics of a lot of this leadership, it was not only about like fundamentally changing the product, the way that the UX worked, the way that the, um, the back end that was working for ad delivery, for optimization, for targeting for just making sure we could build more performance solutions, but then actually having go-to-market leaders and product leaders that really do understand this stuff and had experience um, helping companies grow at this stage as they were going on that same performance journey. Again, you put all these ingredients together and I think um, it's just, a, it's a really exciting time to be at Snap. Yeah, it, you know, there's a point you touched on that I think that like, it, it's again, as just, as someone who, again, like we all, we all follow Snap so closely, that's exciting to hear is that like, I think there was always a broad, everyone knew internally at Snap, at least when we were there, like how important it was to break up the duopoly. But the thing that maybe wasn't consistently kind of believed across the org, which I think now is, is that like the way to do that is to provide like economically rational solutions to advertisers. It's just like as much as these like businesses want to advertise somewhere else, they're like super rational and they will not advertise somewhere else unless it works. And so, you know, as you talk about the team there, it's like that is that is such like a to me it's such a meta type of like kind of ethos. You know, it's like it's like we were kind of like brainwashed into thinking that as I think F&P partners for so long and like Facebook partners. But um I think it's super exciting to hear and again if you go on like X now and you search Snap, the number of direct consumer brand like performance marketers are now like Snap actually works. It is like I check it all the time. It is like fundamentally different than it was a year ago. And I think that's almost like, you know, it's it means something. So I think it's definitely all it's all heading in the right direction. So it's very cool to see. Yeah, no, it's it and and again, like James, you described it, some of those marketers being sort of rational. Um, I would describe some, some of them as being like mercenary, right? And you don't make the change until you have to, or if you can find that extra marginal dollar gain somewhere else, but it's, it's hard to change, right? And 
that we're seeing that in the market where again, it takes a, it just takes time to reposition yourself, help advertisers test, have the right learning agenda set up, make sure the configuration of campaigns is set up correctly from the beginning, start slow, test and learn, scale from there. And, and again, the, it's, it's not, it's not difficult work, but it just requires discipline and it requires consistency and it requires like trust and credibility, which that was another big surprise when I got here is like just the deep level of trust and credibility that a lot of our sales teams have with clients. Like we're very, we're beloved in the market. I, I was going to meetings and, you know, for a lot of upper funnel advertisers who use MMM to drive performance and to track performance, every meeting I went into, you know, the first like quarter I was here, clients would say, Hey, you're one of our top three MMM partners. I, I felt like I was being punked. I was like, can someone show me a bad MMM? Right. And it was, it was just a funny thing, but Again, there was always this rec there, there was always this recognition that, hey, you know, Snap can really do well at driving a lot of top of funnel metrics, but can they do it bottom of funnel? And historically, I don't think we could, but we are in a much different place today given the investments and the bets we made over the last two years. But even within the last two quarters, I mean, I think you're seeing this too, even with small to medium sized businesses. Right. I always say small to medium sized businesses can't afford to spend on things that don't work. And we had a massive increase in the number of SMBs that are using our platform um, that we reported in our Q1 earnings. And again, like this is another strong signal and indicator of being able to deliver better product market fit of performance solutions for advertisers of all sizes. And that that is really encouraging and exciting. But we also know it's not static. Right. We know that performance is always a moving target. Parity is always a moving target. And I think one of the, the last things that I'll say on performance that I've found quite interesting, I had a CMO about a month ago say to me, you know, Patrick, this year, one of the things I'm really focused on is moving from efficiency to effectiveness. And I said, oh, tell me more. And he said, you know, when it comes to Pmax on Google or when it comes to Advantage Plus on Meta, right? Like it's getting harder and harder to squeak out any more efficiency. But what I need to go find is more consumers. And what do I need to find is more effectiveness in other places. And I thought that that was just really interesting because as you reflect even on the last 18 to 24 months in the industry, where it's been about, you know, um, decreasing costs, we've seen layoffs in the industry, we've seen this flight to safety and it's all coalesced around these lower funnel advertiser solutions. And in some ways it almost feels like some marketers are, are like held hostage and almost shackled there because they become so, so dependent on some of these solutions. And I think now, as we've seen, especially here in the U S the U S you know, consumer has been fairly resilient. Inflation, you know, appears to be tapering a little bit, although I know real prices are not. What I, what I think I'm observing, what I think I'm seeing is a lot of marketers saying, hey, we can't, there's no more way we can cut ourselves to growth. And I think that's what this person met about like efficiency versus effectiveness. It's going to continue to be really hard to be that durable with your efficiency. And in order to continue to grow, you're going to have to reinvest and find more places to grow if you want to continue to drive your overall effectiveness. And so I think that that's, that's, an, encouraging, that's an encouraging trend for a platform like Snap, because again, I think we, we provide a very healthy alternative um, with scale and unduplicated audiences that are many times hard to reach on, on other platforms. And so that's very exciting when you put that sort of into all of the other ingredients that we described around what we're doing with, with lower funnel performance. And I, I think part of that too, I mean, over the last like year, year and a half, you guys have done some pretty amazing partnerships with um, like big commerce providers, right? Other places that, that users are spending time and maybe making purchases, making purchase decisions. And you guys are, I would think, or I, I'd say like one of the leaders in kind of leaning into that and actually driving those partnerships that are truly synergistic on helping expose consumers on Snap to new products, to ads, to new brands, and then closing that attribution loop and driving them to places that actually the purchase can be made or they can learn a bit more. Can you talk a little bit about the, 
the thought process and strategy that has gone into that and how you think about um, those types of partnerships that are, are mutually beneficial. And is that like code data yeah. for like what's going on with Amazon? That's exactly <laughs> and right. Like and, 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 and I think, yeah. yeah and, I, and I think you guys are in a unique position because, you know, I think the market is a little more hesitant to, to do those types of partnerships with a, a Facebook or directly um, with a Google just because of their sheer size and what they've done historically, you know, in, in partnership context. So like, to me, you guys are in a unique, a unique position that um, you can drive those partnerships. You guys are truly friendly and mutually beneficial, can provide mutual benefit. Um, so yeah, yes, James. Long window was asking about Amazon and Shopify and some of those. <laughs> you know, listen, I, and again, I think that the reason that we're able to go on a path now and pursue some of these partnerships that you've described, Daniel, is because we have better product market fit in the things that are their core competencies. Whether you're Amazon selling goods, whether you're Shopify helping your merchants sell goods, um, the Wixes, the Woos of the world, like even, even just the campaign management partners. I'll go back to your old world at Shift, James. It's like, you know, if you think about the Smartleys and the Cargos and the Skies and the Media Oceans and a lot of these companies, two or three years ago, their relationships with Snap were, um, they were very like embryonic. It was small. We weren't really considered a preferred partner. And one of the first things that I did when I arrived here last year is there was sort of this small SWAT team um, run by a gentleman named Ali Rana, who was out doing a lot of the partnerships with the ecosystem. And I almost felt like this team was almost on an island and were sort of like not seen or never heard in the company or maybe a bit misunderstood. And that was one of the first places that I leaned into because when I look at our size and scale, we will be dependent on partners to scale. And I think when you find these complementary components and partnerships where we can help partners reach different audiences, we can help them find more effectiveness. We can help them scale in ways beyond just the duopoly. This becomes like incredibly important to our overall business strategy because based on our size, whether it's the number of FTEs, whether it's any other sort of dimension that you measure, like we need partners to be successful. And so as you're thinking about, you know, do you build, do you buy, um, do you partner in order to, to, to grow scale? I think we've been really focused on like, you know, building things ourselves to grow audiences and to improve our products. And then on the monetization side, we've been really intentional about um, just being smart in the types of partners that we want to onboard to continue to grow the share of like the advertising pie that we think is commensurate with the value that we can create for advertisers. And so it's been really energizing and um, it's been a lot of fun. And I think these partners see that we also want to move really quickly. And, um, and, and that's been fun because I think, you know, it, it, it feels more entrepreneurial and um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be, be building again. Yeah, well, and it's funny, you know, that that group was a group that we 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 sort of I think was sort of our baby back in the day. And and I think we were good friends with Ali Rana. And I think you just made his year mentioning him on this podcast. So <laughs> Rana, we did not put him up to that. Um, and uh, but um, maybe switching gears from some of the, the pure ad side. You know, one thing that like the, the market seems super excited about it. Actually, I love it as a user is um, Snapchat Plus. So like you guys have turned into this massive SaaS business, basically, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I'd love to get your take on that. You know, I know there's that no ads option on there. Like kind of how do you see that evolving over time? And you know, maybe even like what's the sales team's like kind of reception to that been? Like do they, you know, it's sort of a funky, but, but really interesting part of the business now. Yeah, no, I, I think it's highly compatible and like very complimentary. I, I don't know, James, like I'd love to test you now and see like, do you have your custom pet Bitmoji that is now a feature if you are a Snapchat Plus subscriber? Um, I, you, I do not. Have your... <laughs> I have a lot of those things set up. I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, well listen, you can set up, if, if you've got a pet, you can do a custom pet Bitmoji now and put a put, put your, uh, your dog, your cat, whatever you like on the, uh, on the snap map, but no, in all seriousness, it's, it's been great. Um, and again, I think this is another example of the company moving really quickly and looking at opportunities to give, you know, our, our, our 
people like more features and functionality um, that provide real benefit and real value. And so, you know, that community on Snapchat Plus, I think it's grown to almost, you know, 9 million subscribers now. I think that's what we reported in Q1. And we've just been really encouraged by the growth of Snapchat Plus. And, and again, the, the features and functionality and some of the new generative AI lenses that you see in there and, and uh, the ability to be creative and funny and playful and more joyous with things like a custom pet that Moji, I think is, uh, is really compelling. And, and I think the price is right as well. You know, it's, uh, it, it's funny again, two teenage daughters that, um, uh, first thing they asked after I stopped, which is when I started at Snapchat was, can I get Snapchat plucked as well? So, you know, we're, we're paying customers here in the Harris house. <laughs> yeah. So, so are we for what it's worth. It's good. Yeah. Um, Patrick, as, as we kind of close out the conversation, I think we've, we've covered a lot about the business and kind of your history and where Snap is today. But as we look forward and there's, there's a lot of topics we didn't cover. I mean, we didn't cover, just mention it, but kind of generative AI in ad creation and also consumer experience. Um, the AR lenses and AR experiences, spotlight. I mean, there's so much that that Snap has been doing. But as you look ahead, like, what are you most excited about for both the the ad business, but also just the app and the consumer experience itself? So, kind of a leading question, but but we'll open it to you now. <laughs> yeah, I think on the consumer side, like, I, I continue to be um, really inspired, just like with the overall user growth. Um, but what I'm most excited about is just, again, all the enhancements that we're making to the ad platform. And we had new fronts a few weeks ago in New York City. Um, we rolled out another partnership back to the partnership conversation with Live Nation. Um, so again, thinking about how we bring communities together, both you know digitally mm -hmm. as well as at uh, music festivals, right? I was actually with the, the Live Nation crew this past weekend at Bottle Rock and Napa to get kind of a preview to see like how we could bring some of these things to life, whether it was incorporating like AR filters into the giant screens during like, you know, a Pearl Jam performance or, hey, how do we get footage of Billie Eilish backstage? And then she's promoting that to, you know, her public profile or the Snap Nation public profile that then we can sell to advertisers. So I think there's a number of things like that that are really interesting on the partnership side. And then on the, on the product monetization side, whether it's things like our AR extensions products. So, you know, you can take 2D catalogs, turn them into these 3D experiences and they can integrate into Snap ads or they can integrate into our dynamic product ad suite. We're launching DPA for commerce. We launched DPA for travel last year. So again, there's a lot of enhancements, Daniel, that are going to happen um, to the monetization suite, which I think is, is really important. And I'm also really excited about the creator opportunity. Um, you know, the creator opportunity is still less than, I guess, 18 months old here. And um, the ability to continue to onboard snap stars, the ability to like show creators how, you know, what you do on snap is pretty much accretive to like who you are in real life and meeting the expectations of like what you would want to see from a friend versus having like this perfectly polished like video or having to do a lot of post editing, like we may be doing in the show, but you know, it's like, it's really, it's just, it's very cool to see, um, the use cases of creators on snap versus maybe other platforms where they're also creators. And so I'm very, very excited about the creator opportunity and about the monetization opportunity and the collaborations that we can do between brands and creators, which, which is really awesome. Um, and those are, you know, those are, those are the things, but I guess, you know, I'm, I'm also just. I'm just really excited to continue, um, you know, continually just like the continuous improvements uh, of, you know, making sure that advertisers, agencies, partners, consumers, and all the other stakeholders that we serve, you know, continue to see Snapchat as a place where they can really drive their business results and where they can drive business outcomes. Um, that are consistent with what their expectations on, on, you know, other platforms or other surfaces. And so, uh, I have a little saying with my team, which is always like plan the work and work the plan. So I think the thing I'm most excited to do for the remainder of this year is just continue to work the plan. Right. And, uh, and, um, excited to do it with like a great team and, uh, and a host of leaders and a really supportive, uh, CEO and co-founder that, uh, is really in it to win it. And that's, uh. And that, that's a lot of fun and it's an opportunity I'm, I'm humbled to, uh, to, to do. That's very well said. 
uh, I, I may I may rip off that line um, because I think that that, that resonates, and I think um, it's again, it's I'm excited to see you guys continue to, to work the plan. It's very cool, um, and like I said at the beginning, I know you have a ton going on, but thank you for coming and doing this with us. Thank you for all your help over the years, um, and uh, best of luck with everything. We're, we're rooting for you guys from the sidelines. Delighted to be here, and thank you for having me.